Thank you, Madam Speaker. I would like to thank the member from Cumberland Colchester for bringing forward this important bill to address environmental racism. The bill tabled by the member requires the Minister of Environment and Climate Change to develop a national strategy to promote efforts across Canada to redress the harm caused by environmental racism. I certainly hope that the government will support this bill and take meaningful action to redress, to really redress environmental racism. As we know, across Canada, toxic dumps, polluting projects, risky pipelines, tainted drinking water, and the effects of the climate crisis disproportionately hurt Indigenous, Black, and racialized communities. We need to look no further to see the impacts of Canada's colonial history for Indigenous peoples. Yet even as successive governments say, they recognize that these historical injustices, so far, we're only seeing tiny incremental measures to right such wrongs. According to the government's own website, currently there are 58 long-term drinking water advisories in First Nations communities, two in BC, six in Saskatchewan, four in Manitoba, and 44 in Ontario. I should know that many of these communities have had such conditions for years, and in some cases, decades. The First Nations Health Authority's Environmental Public Health Services indicated that they are both do not use and do not consume water advisories in the First Nation communities. Do not consume advisories is issued when a community's water system contains a contaminant, a, a, a cont contaminant such as chemical such as a chemical that cannot be removed from the water by boiling the water should not be used for drinking brushing teeth cooking washing fruits and vegetables making infant formula or other drinks soups or ice cubes for bathing infants and toddlers or for pets do not use this issue when the water system contains contamination that cannot be removed by boiling and consumption of the water poses a health risk. Exposure to the water when bathing could cause skin, eye or nose irritation. In what universe is this okay? Behind every community, there are the faces of the people, the children, the elders, people with disabilities. They are the faces of you and the faces of me. Water is life, yet they can't access the very basics, clean drinking water, something that is essential to sustain life. This is happening in Indigenous communities right now. This is what environmental racism looks like. And as an ally of Indigenous peoples, I've attended countless protests and rallies led by Indigenous peoples, the First Peoples, the protectors of Mother Earth, of water and land, and they have demanded accountability. We have protested against Canada's ongoing active engagement in land dispossession and resource exploitation in their territories. Look what's happening with the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion. The Prime Minister ignored the voices of the Indigenous peoples, elders, protectors of land, ignored the science on the climate emergency, and brought the Trans Mountain Pipeline and pushed ahead on the expansion. The Prime Minister is completely oblivious to his own hypocrisy. You cannot call yourself an environmentalist and buy a pipeline, Prime Minister. Thousands of people have come out as allies to Indigenous communities who are opposed to the expansion. Some were arrested for fighting to protect the environment. Watch houses have been set up and to monitor the situation, and they are there in the rain and in the snow. Land defenders continue to take to the street to protest the TMX expansion. We must stop throwing away billions of dollars on the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion and fossil fuel subsidies. The parliamentary budget officer has analyzed the Trans Mountain Pipeline and shown that in all scenarios it has modeled, there's almost nothing that the pipeline would be profitable, which undercuts the Liberals' claims that the pipeline is needed to pay for green energy investments. The Slayothus Nation conducted an independent assessment of the project and found that there is a 79 to 87 percent chance of a spill in their waters over the next 50 years if the project is built. 
in a worst case scenario, they project a spill of over 100,000 barrels at 29%. The risks are real. The question is not if there will be a spill. It is when there will be a spill. The risks are exactly the reasons why the Slave Tooth Nation and other First Nations have not given their free prior and informed consent to the project. The Prime Minister is buying the TMX, TMX pipeline and pushing ahead on its expansion, and it is a clear violation of the UN Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So much for the Prime Minister's most important relationship. And no joke, the day that the government announced it was buying the TMX pipeline, there were new environmental violations for that project. The truth is systemic discrimination has been embedded in our environmental policy making. Enforcement of environmental regulations and laws are often lax. And in fact, most recently, it was found that there had been repeat violations of COVID-19 protocols on the site. According to the Burnaby Now, a report by the Canadian energy regulator, there was, quote, systematic non-compliances of COVID-19 at the TMX expansion project. And Canada's environmental decision-making excludes Indigenous, Black, and racialized communities. And this is environmental injustice. Make no mistake about it. The examples of environmental racism in Canada include the horrific mercury poisoning in grassy narrows. In addition to the frightening health effects of mercury poisoning and the cancer from toxic waste, the high levels of contamination force the community to stop commercial and tourist fishing, one of its last avenues for traditional economic living, while the Ontario government continued to insist the poisoned fish were safe to eat. In urban areas, 25% of the lowest socioeconomic status neighborhoods are within a kilometer of a major polluting industrial facility, compared to just 7% of the wealthiest neighborhoods, resulting in elevated risks of hospitalization for respiratory and cardiovascular illnesses. In Vancouver East, in our East Village neighborhood, they have campaigned for years, fighting against odors coming from the poetry plant in the community. The community has learned that West Coast reduction is looking at increasing emissions of ammonia, of nitrogen oxide, and sulfur, sulfur oxides. Rightfully, my constituents are concerned about this. I've brought this up with the Metro Vancouver, who regulates air quality for our region. Councillor Adrian Carr is the chair of the Metro Vancouver's committee that oversees Metro's air quality, and she has advised that they will consider input from concerned parties right up to when the permit decision is made. Made. In another part of my writing, community members are concerned about the activities of the port. They have been raising concerns about the well-being of a bird marsh at Crab Park. They are concerned that the Port of Vancouver's uh, security fence that is now put around the four-acre empty parking lot beside Crab Park will negatively impact the birds there, noting that there, noting that there are 26 species of waterfowl in the Burrard Inlet. Crop Park is a sacred space for the people of the downtown east side. They fought hard for it, and of course they want to ensure that it is protected. They also want to see a healing lodge at Crop Park to support people in our community, to be able to access a safe space, a place of healing, especially in the face of so much stress and trauma, from the homelessness crisis to the opioid crisis and to the now uh, pandemic. In 2019, Basket Tuscat, UN, the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Hazardous substances, substances and Wastes wrote, and I quote, I observe a pervasive trend of inaction of the Canadian government in the face of existing health threats from decades of historical and current environmental injustices and the cumulative impacts of toxic exposures by Indigenous peoples. In September 2020, a report submitted 
uh, the Human Rights Council titled Visit to Canada Report of the Special Rapporteur on the Implications for Human Rights of the Environmentally Sound Management and Disposal of Hazardous Substances substances and waste states. Quote, pollution and exposure to toxic chemicals threatens the right to life and a life with dignity, and that the invisible violence inflicted by toxics is a insidious burden is disproportionately borne by Indigenous peoples in Canada. Canadians have the right to a healthy environment. Both Liberals and Conservatives have failed to put words in action, and in 2019, they voted voted against the NDP's bill C-438, an act to establish a Canadian Environmental Bill of Rights tabled by the former MP Linda Duncan. In this parliament, they, in this parliament, they also fail to show up for the NDP's bill Bill 232, an act respecting a climate emergency action framework, which calls for the recognition of the right of all Canadians to a safe, clean and healthy environment grounded in a commitment to upholding the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. This was a bill that was tabled by my colleague, the member from Winnipeg.